Welcome to the Map of Forward podcast, Gregory okay. Zamfotis. Thank you. Happy to be here. You are one interesting cat, sir. I really enjoyed deep diving into the kind of history of your story and having a, a conversation with you when we recently chatted. It was super refreshing to have a chat with someone who was essentially born into the industry and just you bleed hospitality, which is just so interesting to me. <clears throat> So probably an atypical path uh, is the what I've forged over these years. So um, my father sort of grew up in the is he dropped out of college and took over the donut shop that he was running at the time and um, uh, started his career in hospitality in New York City in the, the mid 70s. And I came along in the early 80s and. You know, there's pictures of me when I'm three or four years old swatting flies and shaving carrots and seven years old on deliveries and uh, sort of grew up in the business, um, you know, not necessarily like coffee, but in the fast casual um, food space, particularly in New York. So um, that being said, my father never urged me or pushed me to work in the family business or or wanted me to take over anything he was doing. He wanted me to do own thing. So I went to school for banking and then decided to pivot and went to law school. Um, all the while, I kept thinking at some point in my life, I would love to own something of my own and uh, be an entrepreneur. Um, I didn't know what it was, or when that might be. Uh, but after my first real legal job, uh, my first summer after law school, I realized, you know, while I could do it and I could make some money there, um, it was not going to bring me any mm. joy or passion. It was purely for money. Um, so I posited to my father at the time, I said, you know, he had one of his uh, delis was right across the street from my law school. Um, and I knew he needed a, a manager to take over. He had a problem with the previous one. So I said, you know, why don't you let me run the store for you while I'm finishing school? And at first he thought it was a little funny. Uh, his son is in law school and wanting to run one of his delis. Um, but I, I said that, you know, I wanted to test out running a business of my own. Uh, and I had an opportunity having it so close to school and also it was my father's thing. Um, and it was going to be an opportunity for me to run a business, but with the mindset of not just helping my father, but for potentially making it a career path of my own. So when I went in with that mindset, it just felt very different, but very natural to me and um, had some pretty early success at that store was able to boost the sales, saw some really immediate returns in some of the things that I was trying to accomplish. Um, so it was pretty clear to me that that was something I was going to want to do. But that was definitively my father's thing. You know, uh, um, That was me helping him uh, run one of his stores. So every time he would come down to see me, um, we'd go to the Starbucks and talk about life, law school, the business. Um, and then obviously being in the food business, you wind up analyzing every other food business that you go to, what you like, what you don't like, what you would do differently. Um, and after the three or four conversations like that in a Starbucks, I realized, you know, there was an opportunity to do something a little bit different in the mm -hmm. coffee industry. Um, and if you were to have pulled up a map of specialty coffee in New York City in the early 2000s, um, it was pretty wide open. Uh, there was a lot of Starbucks and Dunkin's and uh, back in New York, there was classical delis or caught carts on the street selling coffee, but those who are doing anything of a high caliber, you'd have to go to Brooklyn or Lower East Side or the outskirts of town, whereas my father's businesses were always kind of right down the heartland, that, you know, Midtown, Financial District, where the, most people were spending their days either working, going to school, or potentially living there. So I said, amazing opportunity for me to for hospitality my experience with food service uh, and my sincere interest in coffee to open what became Gregory's Coffee in 2006 when we opened that first store um, with the mindset of really making quality that it was accessible. So how do I take all the greatest parts of specialty coffee that typically were relatively slow, expensive, um, had all those stereotypes of what specialty coffee was, you know, the, the, the stereotypes about what baristas may or may not be. Uh, and I wanted to buck those trends and to um, create something that you could get all the benefits of a Starbucks, the convenience, the access, the, the, the speed, uh, with all of the quality you're finding at some of the more boutiques. I've got to ask you, as someone who is a serial entrepreneur myself, 
what drives that passion? Like what drives, I know it's such a cliche question, but what makes you look at an opportunity like that and say, yeah, I think I can do this in a city as as big as New York, I think I can tackle this. Where do you get your grit and your balls, for lack of a, <laughs> a different word, right? Like it's, it's, uh, we're not talking uh, about just a, a little yeah. country town. We're saying, you know what, I think I can do this in New York. Like that's that's what stops most people, right? Yeah, I think I come from a very unique yeah, I have a very unique uh, lived experience in that my father did it my whole life. I watched him run these small businesses in New York City, and I was like, well, there was nothing else that I could imagine. I'm like, well, yeah, we yeah. run businesses in New York City. I, I had the formula down. It was you make a great product, you have great service, um, you, can, you know how to move a line. You set it up to make it look great. Um, some very core facets that if you could do, do those things well – people will come and support you, right? Um, and he sort of had been whispering in my ear my whole life about how important those things were, how he was able to achieve them in his other businesses. So to me, it was almost like blind, I, you know, blindly just believing in myself, whether I should have or not. Back in the day, if I had made a business plan and kind of figured out how many cups of coffee do I need to sell to break even, I would have been like, <laughs> oh, this is a horrible idea. But I just kind of went in saying to myself, you know, I'm not going to let this fail because I will work my tail off to make sure it doesn't fail. Um, and that's sort of what happened in the beginning. I was there seven days a week, 70, 80 hours a week. Um, and people very much associated Gregory's Coffee with me, not only because of the name, but just because I was there literally all day. Um, and, and it's been fun to see it evolve over the years and see – how much has changed compared to what we started out as and, you know, what I thought was quality and good, you know, 14, 15 years ago today, I would be appalled right. to even serve <laughs> or to think about some of those things. So, but you know, things change at the time. Everything is relative at the time. I, it was great. People liked it. Um, I liked it. I was very proud of what I was doing. Um, and yeah, I think my father was always like that. He was like, you know, you have to believe in yourself and um, if you have the right support and if you're going about it the right way you know of course anybody can fail but uh, if you're afraid to fail you're never going to try um so i just sort of didn't even think of anything other than this is going to work do you believe everyone can do it i'm fascinated by this question <laughs> um it's a loaded question i think i think yes i think anybody can do it but um it does. There are certain caveats to that. You have to be willing to do certain things, invest certain amounts of time, uh, take certain elements of risk, um, go into certain situations not knowing the outcome, and it could be go yeah. very good or it could be not so great. And if it's not so great, how do you how do you handle that? Right? Mm. There's been so many ups and downs, and you know this is we're in the middle of a pandemic. There was the financial crisis in 08, 09. There's um, so many things that have come our way. I mean, my father, one of his businesses was uh, right at the edge yeah, of the wow. World Trade Center, Twin Towers, in 2001. And he had, um, when the towers came down, a car smashed into his storefront oh, and trapped my uncle inside for like a day until like the uh, FDNY had to pry open the storefront and save him. Um, so like literally, if you can watch a terrorist attack happen 75 mm -hmm. feet from your front door, uh you know, there's it's there's always going to be something, you know, as crazy as some of these things have been. Um, if you're resilient, as you said, if you're you're gritty um, and you're just sort of really, truly believing in yourself, I think you can anybody can be successful. But not to say it's easy. And I'm not saying anybody or everybody will succeed. There certainly are um, risks involved. But um, I, I don't want to I am I would say maybe I hit the lottery. You know, I, I grew up um, with the right father the right experience, um, the right um, mix of education and, you know, giving me these opportunities. You you cultivate all that with a specific timing of specialty coffee in New York. And for me, it was a really nice um, uh, tonic that I, I just drank it all the way down uh, Do to where we think, are today. 
I, I'm of this this belief that we're being presented with a very interesting opportunity in life, everybody, whereby the challenges of today, today being 2020 and all the fuckery that's kind of turning up all at the same time, we're being presented with an opportunity mm. to look at where the gaps are in our character and in our lives and in our businesses and in our relationships and kind of say this is a moment that will possibly define the rest of my life the way that I'm handling this and I could look at this and say I'm going to take the opportunities that I never knew if I could or couldn't do before and you're either going to be buried under what you do next by being passive or you're going to find out who you are and where you could get to. Do you think that that's something that's different about 2020 compared to years before this? Yes and no. Um, I think there's always challenges. And while this is a sort of a ubiquitous challenge, we're all sort of facing mm -hmm. at the same time in the same sort of um, – atmosphere you know people may have unique ex unique challenges specific to them uh i've had many challenges that i was experiencing a year or two ago that maybe not nobody else was experiencing the same thing but to me it was it was um this now is sort of we're all in this sort of thing and i think it just sort of put everything into turbo drive where you know there there is no really room for error um and yeah the self-reflection and that sort of mm -hmm. what am i going to do now um, there's really no time for it. You just have to act. I love that. Um, and I think, you know, we just, I've said kind of, as you mentioned, I've, that's how I approached this from the start. There was no hesitation. I mean, the day I, we closed all of our cafes on March 18th, temporarily and March 19th, those who we kept on, we, we had a, a five hour call about all the projects we were going to do while we were shut down. Uh, we had, um, we broke out into teams and had remote calls every day, um, for two months. And, you know, we, we put in some real work and some things that either were, had been on the, the back burner for some time, or were going to get done, but would probably take us a few months to accomplish. Cause we had so many other things happening at the same time. And many things that were brand new that were like, you know, based on what's happening, we really need to know X, Y, and Z, um, I mean, really came out of those two months feeling quite strong with what we, the work we had done. And we started seeing the, the, um, the fruits of our labor once we relaunched, you know, some, some better management, some better inventory, some, some completely revamped our training, um, new procedures, communication. Um, we were able to achieve a lot. And, you know, I think when I speak to many other people who are kind of just, just getting on the phone constantly with people just kind of mm. complaining in a sense or upset. Um, and I'm like, yeah, that's fine. But I mean that and, you know, 225 gets you on the subway, you know, what yeah. are you, what are you going to do? Um, you got to dig in and make something happen. Uh, Where's your tolerance um, for that? So we didn't really waste any time and we were ready. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I think I'm borderline <laughs> psychotic at some times where I club. just like have crazy things. <laughs> uh. I just have crazy things happening to me. And it, sometimes I have to shake my head and be like, is this, you know, I feel like I've experienced so many episodes of like, this could just, this is just, mm. just never happened before. Or like, how could this possibly happen? So you just start to get numb at a certain point to, to things. So even when this happened, you know, I was like, this isn't, this is wild. Uh, to say I wasn't upset, you know, having to make some tough decisions is, it would be a lie. I was certainly not. Uh, happy to have almost kind of watch what I had built for all these years get blown up over a day. But, you know, then you sort of stop, take a deep breath um, and then plow ahead with, you know, the next phase. So we're certainly um, it's things feel different, um, but, you know, everything happens for a reason. You know, this is you know, if this if this pandemic was more deadly and just as transparent, just as easily transferable, we would be this would be a completely different scenario. Like, thank God it is what it is, all things considered. So maybe this is just a warning sign to help us uh, to make sure this something even worse doesn't happen later that we're not prepared for. So, you know, you know, there's so many different ways we could think about, about what's happening for me. Um, it's, it's put the, the gas pedal on a lot of things that I really wanted to do for a long time. Um, and now we have kind of have more time where we're not, you know, 
busy with so many other things that can be distracting and you get this focus to be like, these are the things that I really need to get done right now. Cause it's imperative. If I don't have them, my business is just not going to make it right. So, um, I'll just never let that happen. So we, we work really hard. Um, I have some people that are amazing that work alongside me, uh, and we just do incredible things every Has day. Has it reshuffled your priorities in any way, both personally as a leader and as a business owner? I don't think reshuffled. I think it just sort of highlights uh, a few things that have always been a testament to how I like to lead and uh, – run the company, which is just doubling down on how we treat Fuck, people. I love that. Um, I think, you know, how we treat each other, how we support, I mean, there's so many, you know, again, I've been coming into the city almost every day and, you know, my wife will think I'm, maybe I am psychotic coming into the city every day when it was, um, maybe not so safe or people were really worried. And, you know, I'm like, I'll just do the gloves yeah. and the mask thing. Um, and, be really cautious and wash my hands and sanitize, but I just need to be here. And I think, you know, relaunching the company. And if I were to have done that from afar, it says a very different message as opposed to me being there with them day in and day out, not only seeing me, but showing compassion and empathy for what is going on and understanding how hard mm -hmm. this is for all of us and being appreciative and supporting them. Some people were like, you know, they would come in and then they would get spooked and say like, you know, this is too much for me. I, I, I'm, I'm scared or I'm nervous. And, you know, we'll say, you know what, take as much time as you need. When you're ready to come back, come back. Um, I'm not going to be mad. This is a once in a hundred yeah. years pandemic that's hitting us. So uh, there's no way for me to judge your behavior or um, how you're experiencing things. It's different for everybody. So I think just really leading with empathy, uh, compassion, support, and just kind of really opening the lines of communication to just make sure they all feel comfortable talking to each other and to me and the other leaders in the company. So if there's anything we can do to help them uh, or take their feedback, it's, it's been critical, I think now, and I've seen, you know, how that's worked out so far for us and that we're getting people who are feeling positive and um, supported even in this wild time. And I think it's, it's what I've always kind of, hung my hat on is that I wanted a company that if I was looking for a job, I would want to work here and I would want to stay here. I used to, when I used to hire people, I'd say, if I want, if, if I met this person in a bar, would this be somebody that I would want to have a conversation with or somebody that I would just say like, Hey, what's up? And then I want to turn around and start talking to somebody else. Right. If I'm going to have to work with somebody for 40 or 50 hours or however many hours a week, um, it would be preferable if that somebody actually liked or enjoyed them or had something in common with. So, um, I'm lucky that I have a lot of passions and I can talk about anything from sports to music to uh, movies, culture, anything. Uh, I'm just intrigued by so many different things. So I can talk to yeah. people about just about anything. Um, but then it's like finding that mix where you get people, you know, people have come to us that met at the company or married or have kids or live together or best friends or, or started their own thing off together. So, I mean, that doesn't really happen by accident. It happens because mm -hmm. you find really great people um, that have that something, I don't know, je ne sais quoi, something about them that can just like it's hard to put a finger on, but when you see it, you know it. And when you find enough people like that, it's it's really awesome. So, you know, I really do care genuinely about uh, our people. And I think they feel that and they know it's not just lip service because I'm I'm there with them and I'm telling them straight up and that's just that's it. So they they we pay each other back with just the you know the one thing other. that I got from you from the moment I started talking to you on the phone was that you're a no bullshit kind of guy, in the best kind of way. It's not like you're that. You what I mean by that is you're not faking your genuineness. You're not faking your empathy. Like your genuine kind of presence, and that is rare. For, for me as an Australian that lives in America, it is particularly rare for me to find that here in America, which, and I'm always on the lookout for it, but it's that kind of quality that you see in people that I think are destined to be successful in anything that they do, because particularly in a time like now, people are hungry and thirsty for, here's that word, authenticity. Um, People, people's bullshit radars are turned mm -hmm. up to 
you know, infinity. And at a time when fake news is a thing yeah. and nobody knows what to believe and nobody knows what to trust, people like you are sticking out like crazy. I got to ask you, where did you learn your empathy? I mean, it has to go uh, reasons. I think my parents, I'm a perfect blend of them. My mother is, is the sweetest, kindest, um, most social, like the definition of a social butterfly. Everywhere oh. she goes, she is just the center and people love her and she has a million and one friends. And um, she used to, she, I was not as social as her when I was younger and she used to get bug me and be like, oh, well, why can't, oh, isn't it so easy for you to talk to so-and-so? And it took me for a while to kind of get that mm -hmm. as a part of who I was. But I mean, she was always just so lovely and energetic and um, just an incredible mother and person. And then um, my father, just the the hard work. And But even as hard as he, and he was always so strict with me with school and with holding me to a high standard. So I always never wanted to let him down. Uh, I watched how hard he worked and I always admired that and I saw it. But then at the same time, I saw how he treated his people at his company. And I mean, he had people that were working for him for 20, 25 for years. I mean, like in the food. Wow. Here's a guy right now. He's a guy at his store now who's been with him since like 1985, wow. right, right now. Um, it's insane. He started with him as like a bus boy. And now he's uh, like basically running one of his stores and he's just been there with them forever i mean you don't really get that mm. um unless you know how to treat people and you take care of them and you're just also so i mean he is the realest of the real ones uh and i kind of learned so much from him and, and my mother and i mean i i, I did grow up in the Greek Orthodox <laughs> i used to be Church. married to a greek orthodox so Where, i know what that's worth, worth. There, was a lot, there was yeah 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 so there's a lot that goes into that i was very involved really? in the church growing up i was um uh, yeah, I was an altar boy. I was the president of the youth group. I was, uh, you know, I was very involved. I'm um, still very tight with my, my priest and all these sorts of things. So um, while I don't get to go to church every Sunday, definitely a lot of the values and um, empathy is something yeah. that is stressed quite a bit, in, at least in my experience at the church. So I think those three, Three factors com combined really kind of gave me the blueprint for how to just be a good person um, and be a good person and how to be a good leader slash I hate the word boss. But leader. I, I mean, leader, you know, you're leading, you're leading people um, and you're doing it with respect. You're doing it with compassion and empathy. And, you know, it's. You see on things quite differently, and I think it's so important mm. to do things, as you said, authentically, because people cut through that stuff so easily. And if you're just, uh, you know, you're doing it because you think it's the right thing, they'll sniff that out so quickly. And I, you know, I I usually don't get that kind of feedback uh, for anybody that spends any kind of relevant amount of time with me because they see how much I do care mm. and how hard I work, um, and also just you know to a fault, you know how much I, I try and help people even when they don't know it's help me. Um, so yeah. it's, it's okay. You pay you, you're it, in the cosmos, Balance, whatever it is, right? things always come back around. And it's like, even during this pandemic to be, to be honest, like my, all the discussions, with my landlords, I've had a lot of difficult mm. discussions during this pandemic, but the number one thing most of them tell me is like, I've been a stand up person and very communicative and just good to them for so long that they want to help. Um, and I talked to them like, yeah, I have this, this, the tenant next to you was always late with rent, was always a problem, always bugging us. And they're like, we're not so excited right. to help that person out because they weren't a great tenant. The one thing I was to say to any poten potential landlord, I'm like, call any of my landlords, any uh, 20, 30, however many of them you want to call and just see what they have to say about us. Uh, and uh, some of them did. And some of them would call me back to be like, did you, like pay this guy. I mean, they, they were like telling you whatever you do, you want this guy as a tenant. And it's like, I think that was something from my father was like, always pay your bills on time. Always treat people with respect, you know, answer the phone. Or if you mm. miss the call, call them back, you know, just all those sorts Be of things. Very basic. Um, 
Yeah, when you are, yeah. it comes back because now you need their help, right? And when you need their help, and if you haven't been that good person, guess what? They're not going to help you, and then you're you're, you're up shit's creek. So and able to have these lessons pressed upon me, and it's paid paid back so far during all this by having some really great uh, assistance from people that I really needed it from. And for, and for anyone who's listening that uh, isn't familiar with uh, Gregory's Coffee, we're not talking about one or two cafes. We're not even talking about five or ten cafes. We're talking about 30-plus cafes in two states. Like, this is this – is, we're not playing games here. You know, this is – a well-established brand. It's a lot of, it's a lot of phone calls. <laughs> yes. It's a lot, of, a lot of landlords. Like we're not, this is not little business and this <laughs> is not talking about a staff of 20 people. How many staff do you have? I mean, we used to have um, around 300, three to 350, uh, depending on seasonality or whatnot. Um, and now we're at 75, 80, something like that. Yeah, which is still a lot um, for the number of stores that so, you've got given the situation that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. So we do have 24 of the cafes back open now mm-hmm. um, and hoping to get the rest of them back in the next month. Let's call it. I've got to say congratulations. Um, but, um, that's a huge feat in this been, time. That's, thank uh, you. That's massive. Yeah. I mean, go ahead. Some of, something else my father always told me was yeah. like, you know, keep it lean, you know, like because he always did everything himself. So for me, I did everything myself for a long time. You know, I didn't have any help, any corporate team. And even now, although we do have some help at the corporate level, um, compared to some of my peers, I see we're we're extremely light as a, as far as how many people we have. And we all are like little Swiss Army knives. We do different things. And like you say, well, this is my job title, but I also do this and I do that and I help with that and I do this as well. And it's like, it's just part of who we are is that we just, there's no, no like defined lane to be like, all I do is social media. Right. And that's just my yeah, thing. It's I like wish. my sister who helps with the social media also does like 20 other, <laughs> yeah. I, I, she does like 20, <laughs> 20 other things. Right. So it's like, I um, called you the other day and you were doing the dishes. <laughs> probably you, you yeah were d- yeah Can't i mean myself. you're 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 mm. in it like and i can really relate i am i own mapper forward and i own a bottled beverage company called elixir specialty coffee and people are still shocked when i'm like mm. on the production line and then i'm like i've got to peace out because mm. i've got a podcast this afternoon like it's just you you mm. run lean because that's what's required to understand how your business runs and get through difficult times. Yeah. I said for better or for worse, I know I can fix the equipment. I can train the team. I can pour lots of art. um, I can sell the crap out of anything on our menu. I, 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 no matter what it is, I can get people to buy it just because I have so much passion behind it. So there's, there's really very few things in the company that I can't do if I wanted to. Um, But I'm obviously not saying there's people who are, good right now just because there's specialists and some amazing people around me but mm-hmm. that is to say that i'm willing and able to do just about everything from the dishes to you know mopping the floor to uh whatever it is so um I, there's no pretentious there pretentiousness and um it's all about collaboration and working together i want to ask you about the i'm fascinated by the psychology behind people like us mm. Mm. Do you remember the first time that you hit your first hard thing in Gregory's Coffee? Like, not just like, oh, it's going to be a, a long day. Like, oh, fuck, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. To be honest, I don't know if there's ever been a moment where I said, I don't know if I'm going to survive this. There's been, I remember the first real hard time uh-huh. I had. I think we had just the one, we had the one store and we were about to open the second one uh this is 2009 um and i was on a high because our, our first store had finally like really started taking off mm-hmm. i was excited and we were doubling down our saying we're gonna open another store oh, great. um and the two people that opened were my my store ma- the, the person who i had kind of become my store leader at my first store it was her and her sister um who were were the openers and one of them happened to be the store leader um i had given the store leader a raise you know at that time i forget what it was at that time it was like i given her a dollar more per hour or something like that whatever she was making 
at the time it was probably pretty good money and I gave her a raise uh, leading up to that getting ready to open the second store. Her sister was also doing a fantastic job, but she was just at like a barista rate. Um, and leading up to that same, about to open the second store, I wanted to give her a raise too. I wanted to give her uh, an extra 50 cents. Um, wedding, um, and her sister, who's the store leader, was like, well, if you're giving her more money, then I need more money too. And I was like, well, I just gave you a raise like two months yeah. ago. Right? I don't just, I was doing it because I, I didn't give your sister, I, did, I didn't give you a few months ago now i'm make, trying to make a right and do with her as well um and she was like well i need that i need more money uh, or it's just not going to work and i was like well okay i'm like i don't know what else to tell you i don't i don't have it um i'm like so she she just left and well she said are you serious and i said yeah and she's like all right and then she quit and her sister quit the same day uh, um and maybe not my empathy situation, but at the time I was also like, I didn't really have many other moves at that moment. I'm like, you know, I'm just trying to be fair here and, and helping the other person out. Um, and I said, it's fine. So I opened the store by myself for two weeks um, until I found somebody else to replace. And that person wound up being fantastic. Uh, and she was, she went on to become a big part of the company for the next few years. So everything happens for a reason. Um, but I remember at that moment when I basically I had one store and, almost my entire staff left on the same day um, over something I just couldn't even understand. Um, and it's, it felt like the world was crumbling at the moment, but it was, it was fine. We got through it, um, you know, uh, but that was a tough moment. I mean, I, we have these mastermind uh, groups that we do and they are the highlight of my week in Mapper Ford because it's a bunch of uh, new and recent business owners who come together to discuss, you know, what's ahead and to watch, yep. to watch the exchange between these brilliant minds and enthusiastic souls that have done hard shit before and to see the difference in the inspiration that comes from people telling other people, you want to do the hard stuff because trust me, doing your first hard thing, it teaches you how to get to the next hard thing. And to watch people excited and it's a certain kind of human that can lean into that hard thing and say, this is going to hurt, but I'm excited to get on the other end of it and see what it teaches me about myself. It becomes like this weird drug, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get a – it's like you don't get to the top of the, the mountain unless you go through the valley and you climb it up, right? So it's like it's almost like the, the journey – the journey up is more rewarding than being at the top, right? Like that, that struggle while you're going through what you're cursing. But then when you get to the top, all you want to do is talk yes. about how, how that journey was and all that sorts of things. So it's like, well, like, well, how was the view at the top? Oh, the view was fine, but let's talk about all the stuff that it took for me to get there. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I have, there's stories all over the place with all the, the 14, 15 years we've been doing it and, and the, the curveballs and twists and turns and, um, just even the, permutations of what's been happening in the specialty coffee industry, the equipment and what was in vogue and what, what's trendy now and what was trendy then. And um, even your Australian and the proliferation of Australian style cafes have come in and adjusted how people think about the coffee mm -hmm. scene here in the U S. So there's so many things that have just been so interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, it certainly wasn't easy and never is. And like you said earlier on doing it in New York and especially where we're doing our business, the, no. the rents are not cheap. Um, so you got to be on your A game and, you know, my father always said, if you're good, you have nothing to worry about. So I've, I'm always said like, you know, it took me a minute to figure out what being good in specialty coffee was, but once we figured that out, I'm like, all right, as, as long as we know that's what I can accomplish every day, then, uh, I'm not, that, I'm not that concerned in the big picture every day. There'll be some movement, but like, you know, if you can do these things the right way, um, people respect that and it's not easy to do it because I don't really see anybody else that does it like we do when we're on our what A-game. So, um, what is good in specialty really coffee in your mind? It's funny, right? So we used to serve, um, there was a period of time where everything had to be handcrafted. Like, you know, if you served coffee out of a Fetco brewer, you were just uh, whatever, they don't care. And if you served out of V60 or a B I V like yeah. a blue bottle, like that's oh, yeah. quality, right? Um, and I used to say, if, and I, I went into a blue bottle once and I saw the, the barista pouring, um, doing two at the same time with two hands. 
And I was like, if I had my refractometer and measured the extraction on those two copies, I would bet everything I own that they're not being mm -hmm. extracted to the same percentage, right? It's, it's impossible. Um, so to me, it's about the quality. It was about the quality of the coffee and finding the right recipe in the brewer and putting procedures in place to make sure you're, you're keeping that consistency and keeping the consistency extremely high. Um, and I think we've seen this big pendulum shift away. Now blue bottle does batch coffee, right? That was their yeah. whole sacrilege for them forever. Now it's like, you know, now you see them doing batch coffee. Um, because I think the, the quality of the equipment has, has caught up, but I mean, we've always been of the mindset, like, you know, do great coffee, high quality coffee. Um, don't sacrifice people's time. Don't, you know, you should be able to accomplish this without having to charge an arm and a leg. There's some places you can't get in for under $5 for a small cup of coffee. Now, would I like to be able to charge a premium? Of course, but I think there's a certain value proposition that everybody goes through when they're purchasing their coffee. You know, Starbucks, Dunkin, they serve more coffee in a day than most of the specialty coffee industry yeah. in the U.S. will serve all year, right? So um, they definitely set the bar for what people expect. And if they're charging, call it $2 for a small coffee and you're charging 5 like there's this whole thing. Are you slightly better or significantly better? And I think a lot of people in the specialty coffee industry really think they're significantly better than Starbucks. And when you add it up, I'm like, you might not even be better at all, let alone and what's better? slightly better or significantly better. There's a lot of things that – well, there's because it's, right. it's all about value. Exactly. What do people value in, the, in their experience. It's it's convenience, it's speed, it's price, it's customer service, it's uh, menu offerings, it's the types of things you offer and the prices that you get. You're paying for those, um, or even the ease of ordering on an app, ordering ahead, curbside pickup, drive through. There's so. I mean, for each individual person, there may be something that they weight more than the other. Some people may not be a sensitive to price, but they're rarely mm -hmm. sensitive to, to time. So if you're slow, that's a, that's a big factor. So how do you raise the bar on as many of those factors as possible to make it the least likely somebody will have to be able to discount what you do to say that we don't want to visit your, mm. your shop. Right. So uh, if we say we could be as fast as we can, we raise the bar and the quality as high as we believe we can take it. We train our people and really work again with the support and that family feel to make it that high level of customer service. We give a great menu mix and we keep our prices at a point that we think match the match. People get more similar or more value out of what they, for the money that they're paying out of what they're receiving. And if you do that, I think enough people really respect it and understand it. You know, there's always going to be subjective. Like some people may like the aesthetics of a store or some people may want certain type of seating or a specific menu item that some company has versus another one. Or they might just really love the, the taste of a certain type of coffee or maybe their habits. You know, as you know, people get um, – they get into a certain habit. They go a certain way. They go past a certain coffee shop and it's very hard to break that habit. Um, but overall, we wanted to say – we wanted to give people the least amount of reasons why they wouldn't want to choose us in comparison to anybody else out there. And we feel like we've hit a really nice mix uh, on all of those lovers to say like, yeah, why wouldn't – we go to Gregory's. I'm always on my team. Like you should get, people should leave and be like, why would right. I want to go anywhere else? Uh, if I have the choice. Um, and I think we can do that. And I think that's why we've been able to, um, to do what we've done over these years. And we are in times square where there was, I mean, I don't know what's going on now with how many people are reopened or not, but seven coffee shops within like a block and a yeah, half of our store. Crazy. Um, and you know, it, Granted, it's a dense part of the city, but I mean, how many different, how many options can there be that, you know, you're going to slice up that same piece of the pie. But like I said, when you're good, nothing, you don't have anything mm -hmm. to worry about. So I would tell my team like, yeah, there's going to be blips. Like this year might not be as great as last year because there's three new people, three, three new coffee shops on our block. So of course, so you're going to see some, but they'll come back over time. Most of the, most people do. We've seen it time and time again. Like you'll get a blip and then people do wind up coming back because when they see, um, what, what else is out there? And then they realize, well, yeah, I can get more value out of Gregory's. And I think that's, that's kind of what we've always been striving to do is provide the most amount of value for the guests, um, and really make that quality that's accessible. So that overall quality package that people are looking for and doing it without any of the pretension, without that big price tag, without the slow service and without any of those stereotypes people associate with quality coffee, let's say, um, you have something really special and that's what I think, I think we have. I have this philosophy that better is undefinable. 
it do, better is is something that has to be determined by the person who's on the receiving end of what better might be. And your job as a cafe is to make as many different varieties of better available in your cafe and see if they align with the people in your community. And if if there's a connect between how the people who are potential customers of yours define better and the way that you're defining better, that's when you're going to find and have more people come into your cafe. If you define better as $25 cup of coffee, that's, you know, the at the upper echelons of, you know, what people should be drinking and your customers value a 99 cent cup of coffee, your version of better isn't aligned with their version of better because their version of better is it needs to be cheap and affordable. But if you're able to find as many right. better touch points as a cafe that align with what your customers, your potential customers are going to define as better as well, that's when you've really got this kind of opportunity for synergy between you and the community. And then the foundation behind well, that underpins all of that is a lot of that stuff that I really recognize in you as a leader, this idea of authenticity and empathy and genuineness and the idea of showing up grit and and doing all that like it, it's a symphony of a whole bunch of things that need to come together which seems like the people in your life that came before you whose shoulders you stand on were really conscious about imparting that kind of wisdom onto you it's just really fun to watch oh yeah yeah, I mean, it's funny you mentioned the symphony because we, we use the, or I use the yeah. conductor um, analogy quite a bit where there's so many things happening at the same time and to make sure the technology is blending really well with the experience and the service and the aesthetics and the uh, quality and the menu offerings and all the people involved with to make sure all those things work together. I mean, it is like a an orchestra that you have to, you know, balance those all out to make some beautiful, beautiful music at the end of the day and great taste in coffee and uh, amazing experiences. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I am very thankful for the experiences and all the, you said the, my, my family, my parents, my, my relatives, everybody around that's kind of helped shape me and give me all these opportunities to be, uh, where I am today. You, you mentioned, uh, technology and, you know, we announced yesterday that Eversys mm. is a brand new sponsor of uh, official sponsor of the Map of Ford podcast. And for years I have been saying to our industry, we have to start paying attention to automation because whether you like it or not as yep. a cafe owner, no matter how fucking romantic you want this situation to be, the world is moving at a different pace to your need for romance in your cafe. And the world wants to order on an app, pick up their coffee, barely speak to anyone if they don't have to, and fuck off and go to work. And so consistency and speed has always, whether it was almost 20 years ago when I was a barista or now, it's just becoming more, it's going up the scale of those better things that customers want. It's, it's higher on the list than it used to be. H have... Mm -hmm. How have you found having that kind of technology in your stores lending itself to your success? So, yeah, I'm, I don't know if the word is technophile, whatever it is. I've <laughs> always love been that just word. <laughs> a junkie. I've been a, a technophile. I'm a junkie for the newest, coolest, whatever I can do or whatever's out there that can help me do yeah. what I'm trying to do, but do it better, do it faster, do it more efficiently. Um, almost to a fault. I mean, my, my team used to tease me that they're like, you know, you're, you're rushing to try this new grinder without even like, you know, really vetting it out because like, you know, you tried it for a day and you get crazy. You want to buy 30 <laughs> of them and put them in all 30 stores. Um, and yeah, I think I am obsessed with, Mm -hmm. just what you spoke about and but the Eversys or Fecos or uh, Curtis uh, Brewers, um, La Marzocco, automation. I mean, you know, I think kind of like I mentioned earlier about that hand brewing. Um, and I think there's a certain 
romanticism involved with the brewing of coffee. And there's an element, right. there's a place for that. And I think right. there'll always be a place for it, even in Gregory's, right? So like you said, there's so many people today that really do value, which is, look at, let's, let's be honest, why is Starbucks as big as they are? Because of yep. that sentiment, exactly. People want things quick, fast, uh, reliable, and that's all Starbucks does. They're consistent, um, and they, they have stores everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's very hard to miss one, um, and they're extremely consistent. And people, yeah, are, is the quality at the same level as what you would find at many specialty shops? No, uh, but people are willing to sacrifice that, or, or even, they don't even, maybe they don't even care. Uh, cause they, they just know what they get, right. And they love the app and they love paying with their yes. stars and they love, um, <laughs> the mugs and then the tumblers. And I'm like, you know, if you, if you say some of those things to some of the real diehard specialty coffee people, they look down their nose and I'm like, you know, if you, if you want to know who else we, uh, shoulders we stand Absolutely. on, it's Howard Schultz and Starbucks. I mean, they really, I mean, you know, we, obviously we, you know, they're, they're our competitor. We, we think about them, um, a lot. We can't help it. I'm like, they're the only people like who are your competitors? Like the only company that has a, a store next to every single one of my stores mm -hmm. is Starbucks. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's local competitors, but they're, they're the, the catch all. Um, but you know, I think they've set the blueprint for that consistency level. So how do I make a consistent product that's better than what they do to differentiate? And I think, a lot of the concept, a lot of the, the technologies that are out there, if you implement them the right way, um, really can help you so much uh, mm. to achieve what you're trying to to do, which is making great great quality. Um, but you have to find the right mix for how much of that. I mean, I remember my father we used to have the clicker uh, yep. grinder, which you know you pre grind. Oh, I remember that. Sit in a doser click, 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 click. and you click it. Three clicks and that dosed and, enough. We didn't yeah, weigh anything that was what back it was. then. Three clicks and then. And yes. then you wipe ah! off, like, you know, you, you're, you're grinding like, like 40 or 50 grams into the basket and then you do this tap and twice you're watching on the side 25 when you tap. grams go in the garbage. <laughs> yeah. Tap, tap. And that was normal, but it was, that's, it was the sound, yeah. the clicking, the clanking, the tamping, the, this, the, that it was yeah. part of the expectation of what people had. It was kind of, they associated those sounds with coffee. Right. Uh, and I remember when we had a possibility to upgrade to a doserless Rober E uh, yeah. grinders and there was going to be no clicking, uh, but it was a better grinder. It was more consistent. It tasted better. Um, so many benefits to switching. It was, mm -hmm. it was innumerable why we wouldn't want it, why, why we should do it. And my father was like, you can't get rid of that grinder. I mean, he's like, you're not going to hear the clicking. Um, how do you know that you've been brewing coffee? You're just going to press button. You're going to hear grinding. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's, I was like, we have to do this, you know, not only for waste or for quality, but just, it's just the mm. way that things are going. But we had a legit conversation about clicking. Right. And it was just like that. It's, that I mean, that is nothing to do with quality, just about the sound and the experience. But if you take that and you extrapolate it across, whether it's steaming milk or, you know, they have the auto tampers. Now they'll tamp for you, or they does it in a machine already batch brewing versus um, hand brewing. I mean, there's all these pivots and people will, will try and um, make a case for one or the other. And I think at this point, you also you just have to understand you're either going to lean into the hand na handcrafted nature of things and make that experience so special that people want to engage with that experience. Because if you're brewing by hand, but you see, then you're wasting your time, right? If you're, if you're doing it up front and you're having a conversation with someone, you could talk about the coffee you're brewing about the style that you're brewing it in, uh, why you might like it. I mean, you can have that one-on-one -on -one engagement while you're preparing. Yeah, there's something really special and, and unique about that. If you could do that with a, with a trained barista that knows what they're talking about and knows how to brew coffee, that could be super special and fun. Uh, but, but I would see people back in the day, I don't know if you remember, like the Slayers when they first came mm. out or the high-end uh, oh, La yeah. Marzocco, Stratas, the, and your we, people, we had they to had push like, the dials. You can adjust pressure. <laughs> the pressure profile. You can adjust your pressure during the sun. And I remember saying, what the who fuck <laughs> on earth in a busy setting is going to be oh, man. adjusting settings mid shot. And then I would see, I would go into these stores and, they and what did they do? They were, they were using it like using it like a semi auto. They would press the button yeah. and look at the time and they weren't looking at the shot. They weren't doing the smell. They weren't looking at the pressure because they were doing uh. something else. So I'm like, so they're spending 30 grand on a machine that gives you variable pressure adjustments mid shot. And they, all they were doing was pressing a button and walking away. So I said, you know what? 
there's so many things that you can do and maybe people want to do. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about that consistency and just being able to make it great. Because if you're sitting there staring at a machine just to make a shot that the, only the 1% of 1% of people would even notice the difference between that, that variation in pressure you did at 10 seconds in moving from nine bars to eight bars or whatever it might be that you think it's making a big difference. Very, very few people will notice the difference, but all you're doing is you're staring at a machine machine and you're not staring at them. You're not having a conversation, right? So technology has also opened up for us that ability to have conversation. And I think the more I'm staring at a machine, the less I'm connecting with people. People, Coffee has, to me, has always been a people business, not just the people behind the counter, yeah. but connecting with them over the counter, over coffee and talking about things. And the more we have to be staring at equipment and focusing on these things, it, it removes the ability to have conversation and to make better potentially for people. somebody wants to just grab it and go amazing order ahead on gregory's coffee our app um it'll be ready it'll be packaged nicely it'll be prepared i believe the way you expect it um and if you want to say hi and chat you can if you want to get on your way go ahead if you want to come in and order your your cappuccino or your latte to, to you know in the past you could say now you can't right now but you could still in the store and order it um we'd love to have that conversation you know we don't have enough yeah. now people are, are are feeling very strange that i want to be inside so we relish those conversations i find myself almost like I, i'm really interested in talking about coffee right now if you're in the store so um technology has allowed for a lot of things and we're super excited for for more to come um to kind of make things uh, honestly it's making things better i think there's a lot of things uh you can do uh, around this technology technological and improvement uh or new technologies coming out that can help um buffer the the, the fears that oh well it's going to be cutting jobs or it's going to be making this less uh specialty and more just pressing a button but, but um at the end of the day there's still got to be a person who's got to manage that and manage the experience and and talk through things and it's never going to be 100 percent automated because i see those robots and like They're those so things fucking are slow too like, you know, maybe like there's, there's no quickness to that yeah they're slow <laughs> Yeah. But there's there's also no option yeah. for conversation. I think if all you want is speed, right? Maybe it's just you don't care at all. Yeah, a robot can do that all day. Yeah. Like you can have it. Get a vending hand, machine. Robot, it'll brew your. The robot will brew. Uh, yeah, awesome, right? But that. But then you eliminate the ability to have any element of human connection which people do covet when it comes to their coffee experience too. So um, some people very much just want to be on their way. Um, but even that, seeing that warm and welcoming environment and the experience, even if they're not partaking, it does elevate, it does make that coffee taste a little bit better knowing that it came from a great environment from good people. I, uh, I believe so, that. Yeah, I think there's a lot, lot to it and it gets me thinking about how, how far we can go there. Do you believe that the part of what people are looking for when they come into a cafe, let me ask that different. What do you think it is that people are looking for when they come into a coffee shop? This is, it's, this is a day one question of training, actually. We ask our, our, team, our new team mm. members this exact question uh, and we ask it just specifically because I think it's, there's dozens mm -hmm. and dozens of reasons why people may come in, you know, I would say maybe pre pre COVID, right? Pre COVID, um, maybe it's for great coffee. Maybe it's to see their favorite barista. Maybe it's for the pastry. Maybe it's for reading the paper. Maybe it's have a meeting. Maybe it's a study for an exam. Maybe it's um, for a glass of water. Maybe uh, who knows? I mean, there's um, there's so many reasons why people, you know, that that making that space that people feel welcome. Um, there's no time limit. We you know shops do, I guess, but you know, there's no restriction on using laptops or wi-fi or you know mm. seating limits it's like you know i remember i had a when we had one store uh and it was starting to get busy it was like probably year two in the, in the business and i remember this person used to come in the store and there'd be maybe 10 or 15 people in the queue and she would try and come all the way to the front to ask for a glass of water that we weren't going to charge mm -hmm. her for uh, and she would bring in food for food from somewhere else um and then take a, up a big table and it, it, the my father's world. Oh yeah, deli, I used to tease him about like the, the deli mentality. I'm like, this would never fly, right? You know, like somebody coming from that 
cutting the out, cutting a line <laughs> to get something New for York? free, and then taking up a table <laughs> and staying. Right. And I remember, I don't know, because my first instinct was to be like, "What are you doing?" You know, this is this isn't. I mean, it's it's kind of in a sense it could be seen as a little yeah, bit rude, yeah. but it was also, um, it just seems like not not like the right thing to do. But whatever it was in me, I said, you know what? Fine. I didn't even, I just let it go. And she wound up doing this three days in a row. Um, but I think the fourth day she waited in line, bought a coffee and got a parfait from us. Oh. Uh, and then she wound up coming every day. So I used to, I used to use that as an example. I'm saying, you know, this person came in for every reason that I would consider wrong, yeah. right? She was abusing my hospitality, you know, good nature. She was taking up a taking up seating and areas for, she would take over like a six top table with, with just by herself. Right. So, um, so I was like, this person was offending everything uh, I could think of, but at the same time I, I, I bit my tongue and then she wound up being a regular customer for a long time. Um, and it's not always going to be the case, mm -hmm. but it, it was just one example of, you never know, uh, why somebody may be coming in or what may be going on in their life, but they wanted to interact with our brand or our experience for one reason or another. Maybe it was just because we were the only place around with seating. But then after a while, that person was like, you know what? I actually like this place. Um, and I'm glad I found it. And now I'm going to hang out here and, and give them my, my business. So, um, stuff like that happens too. So sometimes there's, there's happy endings to some of these funky stories. You know stories. what you remind me of? Um, you, your background is Greek and Italian. My background is Arab. Yeah. And I think a lot of our cultures, uh, our cultures are very similar in the way that we train. Mm. We're trained, and I really think it's we're trained from little children in hospitality in the home, right? Mm. Like there's mm. an order to how it all goes, and you're not supposed to serve anything, like everything is served one after the other, and you know when it's time to leave because once they've served the tea or the coffee at the end of everything, you know, okay, so they're telling us it's time to get out of their house. Like it's a, <laughs> it's a very structured kind of beautiful hospitality etiquette that happens, and, and I love mm -hmm. it. Do you think – that that informs a lot of the way that you train your staff and you set up Gregory's because you have a lot of traditionalism. in. Oh, you. I, I, yeah. I mean, like I said, I was, I was a church kid uh, and definitely whether it was, you know, going to Greek, Greek families houses for, for dinner on Sundays, dinner, dinner was usually pretty yeah. early uh, on a Sunday uh, or very late, uh, whatever it was, and still having coffee at midnight. Yeah. Oh, yeah. People thought that was still a good <laughs> idea uh, after their meal. Um, or you go to these cafes, Greek cafes in certain parts of town or even in Greece, and it's like, yeah, they're they're drinking the cafe coffee Neo. at 1, 2 in the morning. And it's, yeah, Cafe Neo, you know, having their cigarette, the, the whole thing. So, yeah, I think, um, exactly. Uh, so we, that experience, again, whether I related directly to how we do things or, or not, it absolutely has influenced so many things about me. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to pinpoint one specific thing or one influence, but it's that confluence of things, yeah. including my, my background, my family, my schooling, my, my church, my friends, my, my work experience. Um, uh, all those things together have kind of shaped or even like the types of places I like to go and what, what I like about them or whatever it is. And it's like, um, it helps me shape how we want to run this business and how we want to work with people. Um, so yeah, I couldn't, couldn't, uh, agree more with you about, about that heritage bit. Cause it's, um, it is funny. Um, whether the Italian side or the Greek side, they're both funny on, on their own <laughs> for their own. Yeah. Thing. And it's, it's, we were having a, a conversation in one of our mastermind groups about what the idea of hospitality is and, there's a lot of different cultures uh, that inform the people because they're from all around the world. And we were having this conversation, actually, shout out to Kevin Leal, who has a cafe in Jersey City called Battle Cat Espresso. And mm -hmm. we were talking about his Mexican heritage and how, you know, he's trying to think of what the way forward to adapt during these times are. And uh, we were talking about how very similarly to the Greek and the Italian and the Arab cultures, the Mexicans have this he heritage kind of hospitality approach to things. And, and it, was, 
almost this permission to give him to like lean into that because it may not be necessarily a, a specialty coffee kind of written rule or anything like that but beautiful hospitality is beautiful hospitality when people feel welcome somewhere they feel accepted and they feel it's an intangible asset that you can't fake I don't think you can fake it I think you either know how to do it or you don't you can learn how to do it but you can't fake it yeah I mean like we've been saying I think authenticity um you know, it can be, it can be learned and, and uh, you can give, develop sort of that muscle memory, I think over time, if you've immersed yourself enough in it. Um, but I think, um, growing up in it is, a, is certainly an advantage. Like I said, I've probably hit the lottery in a, in a number of ways with the, the experiences I've had and mm. again, how it's shaped my visions on hospitality, on leading people, on how to communicate with people, or even how I think about running the business. So, um, consider myself very lucky um for for a number of reasons but um very happy that i've had this experience uh that allows me to kind of think about yeah. the world the way that i do and i'm oh, sure yeah. you think the same with the uh the yeah. arabic oh <laughs> I, I remember yeah. being Beautiful. in syria for the first time when i was 14 that's where my family are from and up until that point it would give me a stomach ache to say a sentence in arabic right so I spoke very, very little Arab, mm. Arabic and I was in Syria and I would watch the level of hospitality from strangers. I would watch people that you would walk past who, who you walk past their house with your parents and, and uh, it's a village and people couldn't do enough to have you like come into the house come visit come and sit down and have we ha we drink mati in australia uh, yerba ma in sorry in syria yerba mate mm. and so they'd say you know come in and and have some mm. mati with us or well, let me pick some grapes off the off the the vine leaves and we'll we'll have some grapes from from our vineyard and i'm like this is just a whole different world like you people speak in love and they you know, it's this whole yep. other different language. And then when I went to the Greek islands, I was in Samos, Santorini, um, oh, a couple of other islands and, and Athens. And the thing that blew me away was mm. that even though we were just tourists, my ex-husband and I, we got the same kind of like love language from people who just wanted you to feel welcome. You don't get that. Yeah, I, I, I'm. It's yeah. it's very special when you experience it. Um, and my, I brought my wife to Greece for the first time uh, about a year ago. Um, just for I had been many times mm -hmm. when I was younger, um, and actually my best friend from college uh -huh. uh, was from Athens. He came to he came to the states for school, and you know we're still best friends and. I had my third, I just had a third baby uh, about four weeks ago. Uh, and he had, th thank you. He had his first child oh. like two days before mine. So we were fine. We were going through that whole thing the whole time. But when he, he got married uh, about a year ago and he invited us and it was a really bad mm -hmm. time for me with the business. And I mean, to be, I spent 72 wow. hours in Greece, I, oh, to, yeah. which it's is, hell. you know, the flight to get, uh, we literally flew there. We flew there, went through the experience, uh, but my wife was so blown away, not only because, because I had been there multiple times, but a lot of these people I hadn't yeah. seen in like 15 years. And she was like, you have, she's like, I feel like you have more <laughs> friends in Greece than you do in the States. And I, so I was at this wedding and there's easily 50 people that I've known for years. And that, you know, it's a whole thing where they just drop like those Yesterday. 15 years. It's like we were, we never left. Um, and they all were driving us around, taking us to restaurants, taking us here. So, and she was just like on, a, on like a whirlwind. 72 hours where we were just royalty. kind of treated like royalty almost by all of these friends. They would never let us pay for a thing. Chauffeuring. I, mean, I didn't even, I was like, I thought I had no expectation. We were just going to go there. But I think they were also happy we were there. And also just like um, couldn't believe we would make such a trip um, given all the, at the time that was happening with my business um, and the time turnaround to you know, taking a 13 hour mm -hmm. flight for 72 hours our trip um, is, is kind of crazy, but 
to me, I was like, there's no question I'm going to be there for my friend's friend's wedding. Um, but they they blew us away with how they, they paid us back with the amount of love and attention and hospitality they gave us. And yes, yeah, so I can't I can't uh, agree more with some when you experience it, how it feels. And when you try and express that to, to other people, be like this. Is, if you could accomplish even a, a portion of this every day, you'll never have to oh, worry yeah. about anything because people will just want to be couldn't help. Especially in a world where we're, we're all kind of hungry to be connected you know there's so much disconnection that's happening in the world today Mm. i feel like cafes are that kind of place where you can easily deliver a level of connection that people are really desiring right now and it's not difficult right like just let your customers be seen and and being seen can happen in 30 Mm -hmm. seconds it it really can happen in 30 seconds yeah i mean I mean, you see it, the transformation, you know, people walk in and, you know, in our business, sometimes it's early in the morning and what, whatnot, and they're craving that they, to begin their daily ritual. Some people, their day doesn't start until they have their first cup. Other people, they're just really looking forward to it just because they love it. They love being around us. Um, and yeah, you watch that transformation happen where they're, they go from before Gregory's to after Gregory's. And the minute they have that interaction with us and they have that coffee and it's like, wow, now they're ready to really go and do what they need to do. And like you said, it could be 30 seconds, it could be longer, uh, but those little instances and those moments are what I live for is just kind of experiencing that and watching the, the joy in people's faces that hopefully we can deliver. You still yeah. get a high seeing people walking around the street with my cup, oh, yeah. right? Like, you know, or like it's, it's, it's the coolest, right? And it, it doesn't ever get old uh, when I see it. Um, so half the time it's expected because in certain parts of the city, I do have quite a number of stores in a close uh, proximity yeah. to each other. Um, but sometimes I'll see it on a part of town where I have no stores. I'm like, oh, wow, great. Uh, and if I'm wearing the hat, sometimes uh, people will, will come up to me and chat. But sometimes half the time I forget I'm wearing it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's uh, the part of the I'm, experience you know, like said, that you I'm, can't I'm, pay for. You can only earn, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think anybody that knows me or comes in the stores, they'll tell me they're always rooting for me because they're like, I don't know anybody that cares more, works harder, uh, uh, or truly, I don't want to, nobody deserves anything, but, you know, who deserves to have good things happen. You paid your dues. You know, I I really, I I work, I really do Mm. care so much and work so hard and, um, you know, I've, I've done not every, not everything's been easy. I always, sometimes I find I feel like I take the, the hard routes, uh, mm. sometimes just cause either I don't know any better or I'm just, I'll just do it myself. Um, and it's, I don't regret anything, but, um, it's certainly been fun. Do you ever wonder way. if that's a trap uh, that we get stuck in as people who have like built shit that from the ground up, I'm, I'm going through that at the moment, this idea of, you know, they, they say that there are certain people that have been built a particular way where they like to do things the hard way or they like to do things the easy way or they, they get into a rhythm and a flow about things. Do you think you, can, you get stuck in the idea of having to do things a hard way, you personally? I don't... If I if I knew there was an easier way, sometimes I would do it. But I, I I'm also maybe it's my turbo ADD that I've I've inherited. Certainly inherited that from my father, <laughs> which is like I I see something and I want it. Whether it's tech, whether it's a new improvement, whether it's a new menu item, uh, and I I need to have it as quickly as possible. Um, just because I. I, I, I can't know there's something else out there Helpful. that could be an improvement or something better and watch it not happen because of either a delay or something I'm waiting for. So many times I'm just like, no, we're just going to make this happen. And if, if somebody else can't help me, I'll be like, well, then I'm going to do it. Um, and I'll usually just bulldoze things and get it done. Uh, and again, there may have been an easier solution, but sometimes I'm not, I'm not of the minds to be like, oh, well, let's, Let's write this down and do a 90 day rollout yeah, no. plan. And, you know, and again, that's, there's nothing wrong with this. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think actually there's some, there's a healthy mix of that that has to happen, but sometimes I'm, I'm just not yeah. willing to wait. Now you've mentioned it. Um, so 
Um, there's always a you've mentioned a couple there. of times uh, during this conversation that you're into music, and I'm a musician. I got to ask you, what kind of music do you listen to? Mm. Everything, right? It's funny. I I, <laughs> I really do listen to everything, uh, but I uh, I'm it's it's so bizarre because I you know I grew up listening to um, like my father was very big on uh -huh. classic rock and roll. Um, so I grew up listening to a lot of like the, the, the big did. band, like Led Zeppelin yeah. and Pink Floyd and the who and J Jimi Hendrix and whatnot. And then, you know, I was in the, I was in high school in the nineties and this was grunge and Nirvana and those sorts of bands and Pearl Jam. And then we got into hip hop, like Tupac, all these, all the, I, I, I kind of went through all, yeah. the, all this great new music coming out and it kind of shaped me so that like I could and then uh, towards later in the 90s I was into heavier metal and whatnot and I was going to Ozfest every year to see uh wow. Ozzy Osbourne and Metallica and all these so I've I, I've and these were all w before I was in college so I was I went from classic to grunge to to hip-hop to metal and it, so that I can jump into any of those and be really happy um and then dance music you know techno whatever it doesn't really matter um I felt like I've been in this lull lately where there's just like I'm listening to music or the new stuff coming out and I'll listen to it just because it's it's fine. Uh, but then um, I don't know why I started dipping back into the classical stuff in this week. Well, because it's good. <laughs> it, it's I'm, timeless. Well, well, again, but you don't. Sometimes you just forget yeah. that it's there. Oh, yeah. Um, so I listened to the Beach, the Beach Boys Pet Sounds uh -huh. album um, and I totally freaked out because it's been probably like a, a decade since I'd listened to that album. And I'm like, this is just like probably one of the best albums yeah. I've ever heard. Uh, and then, of course, I go to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Heart Band. And I'm like, okay, well, this one's probably better. Uh, but those two, I, I, I was like listening to Sgt. Pepper's the other day coming into work. And I was like, I think this has got to be one of the most beautiful pieces of music I've ever heard. I mean, those that album is ridiculous. Uh, so I've been on this big Beach Boys, Beatles Bob Dylan. Uh, Are you a Doobie Brothers fan? The past, like, I haven't dipped into them as much. I mean, I have listened mm -hmm. to them in the past, but it's been. I don't know why I've just kind of really jumped back Boys. into this very specific genre. Where did yeah. you get exposed to um, be the Beach Boys from the, your dad? No, not even really. I don't know why. I think I always thought the like you think of like like the the surfers type of stuff they did, and that was always really fun. And I'm, I don't know. I must have heard it yeah. at some point in my life, uh, and which I maybe enjoy it. But I think when I listen to Pet Sounds, I don't know if you're familiar no. with the album. No, I mean I'm sure I am, it's but such I, a uh, no. I mean, it's you should listen to it because I think it's. I'm writing it down. It's a masterpiece. Uh, um, so because it's you think of the Beach Boys and you think of Surf in USA and California Girls and yeah. Barbara Ann and yeah, all yeah. those types of songs, and then all of a sudden you listen to this Pet Sounds album and you're like. It's it it's it literally is on the level with Sgt. Pepper's really? the Be the Beatles Sgt. Pepper's album. Yes, the musicality, everything about it. Paul McCartney said God only knows which is a Beach Boys song is the best song ever written. So this is Paul wow. McCartney saying that about a Beach Boys song. Which uh, uh so uh I I define people this way, so be careful what your answer is. Mm. Who's your favorite Beatles <laughs> songwriter? Paul McCartney. Okay. We can't be friends. I love I love Sir Paul. <laughs> oh, you're, you're no, Lennon, no, no, you're no, Lennon no, 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 no. Oh, yes. oh George Harrison. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I love George. I think maybe it's because I grew up playing bass guitar. So uh, I, I knew you, you, for Paul. you were, uh, yeah, you're some sort of a musician, but yeah. which one I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah, so no, I, I don't know. I, I think I had a lot of friends who played guitar and they had started much earlier than I. So I always felt like it's going to take me so long to catch up to them. And none of my friends played bass. So I picked up the bass um, and I started playing that all through middle school and high school. Um, and then obviously when I looked to the best bass, I mean, I had arguable, I mean, obviously different levels. But when I, I loved the Beatles and Paul was the bass player. So I always found myself um, very much connected to him. Um, but yeah, certainly I, it's hard to go wrong. There's He's so many such a good great songwriter. Beatles, and you listen to he is. Yeah, and I mean, even if you listen to 
uh, within without. And you, I mean, I, there's certain songs that George has written that, you know, I, I'll go back and I'm like, I love, I, I go back to, to the credits to see who wrote it. I'm like, Oh man, yeah. this guy is, this guy is a monster too. So I, I love that guy. I, I love him. Uh, I just genuinely think that band is insane. Uh, so that's who I've been on lately. Um, but people will tease me cause I'm, you know, whether it's Cardi B, I love Cardi. I was very early on Cardi B. Are you, Cardi B are fan. you a fan uh, of what? And there's certainly. No, Cardi WAP, B. the new song. Have oh. you heard it? Fan? <laughs> yeah, I've heard it. Uh, not, I think it's it's one of those like, yeah, I can I can I can listen to this and I get a kick out of it. And I'm also like, man, I actually, if you want to get down to it, I'm like the way that they put words together and the word the word it's play very I is smart. actually pretty pretty good, very smartly written. Obviously, the the, the context is interesting. Quite, uh, extreme. <laughs> uh, yeah, interesting to say the least, and it's certainly triggered many conversations. But um, I think it's a good song. Uh, it's 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 a good song. Am I going to dial that up? For uh, probably my not. Probably not. No, no. Uh, no. Uh, but it's it's part of the culture. I'm I'm very aware of what it is. I I I'm a big Megan The Stallion fan. I'm a big Cardi B fan. I'm, I love their music. So obviously, I have to enjoy that song too. But. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a fun uh, hot button topic. I got to ask right you. Now. I'm a bit of a rap fan, um, and so I didn't become a rap fan until I was here trying to learn about Black culture, and mm-hmm. so I started really deep diving into Wu Tang Clan and Tribe Called Quest and MF Doom and mm-hmm. uh, Meek Mills and Jay. I've always been a Jay Z fan, but those are the kinds of artists that I was uh, kind of deep diving into. What was it like? living in New York throughout the the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s and watching like rap really it wasn't that it defined itself but it had this pulse in New York that was different from anywhere else in the world were you into it around that time yeah I was I mean I was young but I remember when I was um what grade was I I don't know I must have been in like sixth or seventh grade I don't know if you remember, people used to have answering Wait, machines. Uh, bro, I'm so much older than you. <laughs> yes, I remember. The, <laughs> well, okay. Well, we had an answering machine, and it used to be you you? dial one for Greg, <laughs> dial two. So when you would hit one for Greg, it would transition to, I love it when you call me Big Papa from uh, B-I- B-I-G. B-I-G. That was like, it would you would hit... You would hit one for Greg, and then you would start hearing the, a Biggie <laughs> song, and then I would be like, "It's Greg, leave a message." So I mean, I, I was, I loved that, and probably one of my favorite rappers of all time yeah, was Snoop Dogg. So I think amazing. when, um, the, so it was like the New York scene was very early. I had a, I used to have LL Cool J uh, cassette tapes back wow. in the day, um, and I was obviously like for the New York scene, it was LL Cool J and so many legends. I mean, a lot of those guys were, I was too young to really appreciate it. I don't think my parents would have let me listen to some of that Uh when I was that young. Uh, But um, definitely notorious B.I.G., Wu-Tang Clan, ridiculously popular and and happy with those. And Tribe Called Quest. Amazing. Similar, the level, you know, I've actually met him a few times. He used to be a resident DJ near one of my stores. He's the nicest guy and also a ridiculously brilliant uh, musician. Uh, oh, yeah. He has the amazing ear um, for music. Um, so I love Tribe. Um, and then it was the West Coast rap was what really kind of was like, actually really picked up in those 90s when it was like before P. Diddy and Mace. It was, uh, I remember I used to watch, it was like MTV. It was crazy. All you do is all these, the, the hip hop music videos. And but it was they so only put cool. the hip hop ones in, um, on late every- at night when everyone was asleep. Um, so, well, I would watch, I, I used to, I, I used to watch those for sure. And it was like, when I would watch some of those videos, like I remember when Tupac dropped his double album and it was California love and him and Dr. Yeah, Dre, man. and it was, they were, it was like this post apocalyptic vid- music video. And I'm like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen, uh, at the time. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was really interesting um growing up but obviously not having much relevant experience with what what the subject matter was but just really appreciating the music and it was just very it felt like it was taking off and obviously now it's it's bigger than ever right with the hip-hop dominating all the charts and um being uh so it's 
watching the, the evolution and the, thinking about rock and roll and you know my my some of my friends we also love oasis uh -huh. the band and it was like you know um thinking about when the last big rock band was like coldplay maybe i don't even know who was, who, was big... who you think of like that just a really like in the in the last 15 who, 20 who years i can't think big, of like big... who like a yeah. new big no i think you're right it's coldplay Cause, I mean, you had you two you had oasis you had coldplay but I'm like, I don't know who else is really out there that's kind of that big. Uh, all those big, big stars now are Billie Eilish and Katy Perry. Or, um, yeah, obviously, and... hip hop is huge. Yeah. Country singers. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 You said you like metal. What do you like? Are you a Dream Theater fan? Oh, well, I was a. Dream Theater? A what? Do you know Dream Theater? You strike me as the kind of person, particularly as a. Do you no. know who they are? Okay, that's your homework. No. You must tell me. It sounds from it sounds familiar, but yeah, I was I was uh, Metallica. I was Seven Dust. I was um, all these others like this band called Snot. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it <was> weird, uh, <laughs> but I used to listen to them. Um, yeah, um, Iron I don't Maiden. Listen to it as much now, like new or like Iron Maiden, Slayer, Pantera. Corn, um, yeah, yeah, you know. Pantera, yeah, I oh, love, Pant love Pantera. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Big Pantera fan, and then even like Sepultura, which is like a Brazilian screamer okay. brand. Um, so yeah, I've literally, I've run the gamut of the types of music that I've listened to. But I probably come back more to classic rock. I always kind of gravitate back there, just because the music was just so well, beautiful it's safe and it's, as well, I guess right? it's timeless. And I listen to great hit. I listen to great hip hop now and I'm like, you know, it dates mm. itself very quickly. Like you can't, some of these things you don't listen to them a year later. It's just like, you can hit it very hard for a month or so. And then I'm like, eh. you know, there's not that many artists that put out the kind of music that kind of feels timeless. Like you're saying, it's very much just like of the moment. Um, but I definitely have some artists now that I, I some rap artists that I'm, I'm obsessed You know with, what so. I find really interesting about rap music? I don't know if you listen to Greek music or you grew up listening to Greek music. Yeah. I grew up listening to a lot of operatic yeah. Arabic music and I'm still obsessed with it. And I, I'm a singer, so mm. I've released albums and shit and exploring new genres of music helps inform a lot of the culture that I have experienced since moving here. Mm. And the thing that I found about rap music that has just – blown my mind is that there's a lot of correlations between like greek music arabic music and the storytelling in rap music and the way that rap music is being used yeah. to tell the story of what's happening culturally now the people seem to be ignoring i mean i don't know that's a big statement to say people are ignoring it but it's almost like this people are absorbing the pop nature of what's going on without understanding the very deep historical message that's being laid out in a lot of it just like these old operatic greek mm. greek songs and and arabic songs you know that tell the stories of like the wars that went by and and what's happening you see a lot of that in tribe and you see a lot of that in mf doom and they've been telling these stories of in very specific right. In specific artists, yeah. Others, it's like very face value and it's just <laughs> fun. Yeah, fun to listen to. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, plenty, uh, certainly plenty of Greek songs. It's always the, the guy who's yeah. lost his girl or sad about it. Yeah, I don't know how many <laughs> Greek songs I have to hear about, you know, how many, uh, how upset this guy is over losing, losing his, his, his woman. But um, this, uh, that's a timeless a tale of right. all, uh, all time, right? It's always about love and loss of love and um, wanting something and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I think the there's some beauty in the storytelling and some of the, the hip hop storytellers are, are all time, yeah. you know, they're poets, you know, uh, Nas. you listen to like wow. Nas in the nineties, <laughs> Illmatic. And it's like, that's, uh, he, I mean, he is, yeah. he is, his family, his father was a, was a poet. I mean, it's, or classical Jay, classic Jay Z mm. or any of these, even, um, I love young thug and young thug, uh, gender bender and also, um, ridiculous storyteller, little Wayne. Yeah. I mean, there's just, uh, there's some guys that are just or girls that are just extremely talented. Um, and the way that, Hip hop uses wordplay to tell stories and the musicality. That's it's so smart. I think the ones who do it really well. 
the ones who do it well, it's, it's why I was always attracted to Snoop Dogg, mm. to be honest. I, think, I thought his wordplay um, and his musicality was very special and unique. And I was always blown away with, with what, how he was able to, to get his message out, whatever the message he was trying to get across, um, whether it was a fun one or a yeah. cultural one. But um, yeah, you have, yeah, I have a lot of respect for the way that those, those people are able to, to, to do that. So. Big fan. So many. I, I could talk about. Do music you a lot, but, yeah. do you record any of like do you write, record, do any of that stuff? Yeah, music? I mean, I know you're busy, but do you have any time to do that? No, I sold my mm. bass. Uh, I don't I know. I hear you. Fifteen, twenty years ago. Yeah, and you know, it's one of those ones. I don't have my calluses anymore. It so, would hurt um, to start I'd again. Have to, I'd have to build up. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I used to, I used to, my my teacher used to have me just you know practice, practice, just move my fingers. Uh, you know, he didn't want me using a pick, Ouch. so um, I was a I was a plucker. Yeah, um, but I miss it. I do. I I used to read sheet music and um, and um, I really did enjoy it. But it's yeah, for me it was one of those you had to pick and choose mm -hmm. where I wanted to invest my time. And for me at that time it was much more into sports and and my uh my education so i just didn't it's one of those where if i can't do something really oh, well i'm I have right a hard there time, with you um doing something halfway yeah. so i used to do like brazilian jiu-jitsu um at a point um and i wasn't i would just i would go five days a week yeah. every week for like two years um and that's just how i do yeah. things right and it was well like, you're uh, a gritty person cro i did crossfit for a while yeah it's like you, you when you when you're into it there's no like dipping your toe. I might dip my toe to just make sure it's something I want to invest some time in. Once I want to invest my time, then I really want to be good uh, at something. And it drives me, whether it's at in business or athletics or or anything. Uh, it's it's something that's important to me to just, you, you really want to stick to something and have that relentless pursuit of excellence. Who chooses the music in your cafes? Um, I guess myself and my chief of staff. I used to just make all the playlists uh -huh. myself. And I used to pride myself on that. And I did that, I mean, honestly, I did that for probably like yeah, 11 wow. years uh, where I was doing that. Um, uh, and now my chief of staff and I, we basically work with a, a service um, that um, they put these like little servers in our, our stores and we'll give them a base. It's almost like creating a custom yeah, like, yeah. Spotify playlist where you give like 30, 30 or 40 songs as kind of the baseline information. They use an algorithm to create sort of like it's it's we, obviously we pay them and you're paying royalties yep. for the music but it's um it's a service that kind of creates the kind of mood and energy based on the sort of base number of songs so we'll kind of pull some out and insert some yeah. in from time to time but uh to kind of keep the music fresh and it keeps a similar type of feel and mood and beat and uh level of music throughout the stores throughout the day so um yeah it's something i take a lot of pride in i like feeling mm -hmm. that energy and um you know, for a while, it's like all my, it was all just my favorite songs. And just, I would have like three or four different versions of it and slice it up and mix yeah. it in here and there. And um, people would be like, oh, yeah, who makes this playlist? So there's a lot of hip hop on this playlist. Who made this? Hip hop and they see does me, make like, coffee taste better. Back and come, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Uh, made a lot of things in my life better. So oh, listen to Jay Z's it, so. Black Album, um, you put that on and it's. Uh, yeah. It's really fun to watch a room respond to songs like 99 Problems. Like I used to enjoy the little experiment yeah. of, you know, being on bar, there's 100 people in the cafe, tables are all full, everyone's chatting and you notice once you've put something like 99 Problems on, people don't realise that they're starting to have their conversations and they're banging their heads at the same time or tapping their hands on their coffee mm -hmm. cup. It's just really fun to watch that kind of energy oh, yeah. take over a room very subconsciously. And, you know, it's a very kind of yeah, chill I mean, cafe, but you, still. Yeah, I mean, you think about music, you think about uh, textures and... Um, so many different things that you can adjust somebody's experience without them even realizing it. Um, so yeah, music, music's oh, it's, big. It's, so, um, I love indulging in, in, yeah. So with that little algorithm thing that you were talking about there, that you feed that algorithm 30 or 40 songs, how does, how does yeah. it, how does it adjust to, 
Uh, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but so you give it 30 or 40 songs and then it picks songs that are aligned with the mood of those three, those 30 or 40 songs? Yeah, so you're saying, look, I'm looking, you know, you give it like up, upbeat, slow, calm, energetic, you know, you give it a few descriptors mm-hmm. um, and then with that base level of types of songs so if i put, if i give them 20 hall and oats songs i want it to be upbeat they're going to give me you know a very heavily 80s yeah. 70s and 80s influenced uh, uh playlist that's going to have energy and sound like uh my boy daryl daryl uh, and john oats yeah. crooning you know what i mean so um it's i don't know if i i don't know exactly how the algorithm works i just know that we give them the general idea of what we're trying to accomplish and songs that we really like and and then it all uses that to create a playlist or a, a set of songs that it enables to um to bounce around through a playlist and continually like evolve what's on the list based on that core set of of parameters um and puts things in and out over the course of it refreshes every every week or something like that um so yeah it's this Duke, company what's called it jukebox. called jukebox Oh, Juke Jukeboxy. I'm gonna like jukebox with a Y at the end. Check that out. I'm I'm intrigued by um yeah, they're, they're pretty by good. how they're people very... are using algorithms in the coffee industry right now. There's you know a bunch of different ways that people are trying to figure out how technology can drive a number of different elements of what happens in the coffee industry. And uh, there's you know that's a rabbit hole that you can go down. Uh, I'm fascinated by have you have you heard of a podcast called Rabbit Hole? by the New York Times. Mm-mm. It's this podcast that talks no. about how people have gone from, you know, watching YouTube videos to becoming extremist QAnon kind of uh, minions and how algorithms have pushed them in those directions. And with people starting to introduce algorithms into the way that specialty coffee works, I wonder if they're going to be able to push people into a specific direction of, you know, a coffee kind of rabbit hole. This is how you should be experiencing your coffee. This is where you should be experiencing coffee. This is why. And through exposure based on what an algorithm is telling you. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's already happening though. Star, Starbucks does this and they've been doing this for years. Um, they they yeah. dictate behavior I mean, through their app and their email messaging, I mean, I'm jealous to be honest. The the the, the custom you don't realize that the promotions that you get are customized based on your experience. So, I don't go to Starbucks very frequently. I do have their app, so they will send me prompts like a prompt to use a discount to get into the store because they know I don't go very frequently. Okay. Somebody who goes every single day is not going to get the same prompts. They'll get a very custom. Uh, they they have a new pr- product launch, so they'll give you an incentive to get that product at a discount if you buy x y or z so they're the time of day because tr- they know that in aggregate they're trying to get more businesses a certain time of the day and they want to push a certain type of item and they'll upsell you or they'll, they'll push things on the on the app in a certain kind of way um that they're trying to get more and more people on their app and the more information they have about you if you ever go in their in their stores and you put their you try and log on their Wi-Fi, they not only do they ask for your email, but they ask for your zip code. If you you know why they ask for your zip code, yeah, it's because once you have that piece of information, that they can yep. go target you, you yep. and they can actually backtrack into your uh, mosaic profile and then learn about who you your are habits based and, on just an email oh, address yeah. and your zip code. So much more. Yeah, without your zip code, it's much harder to do it. And I, at first, I didn't realize why they asked. Why I met a company that does stuff like that, um, and they'll show the zip code. It's all over. I'm like, wow. So this is why they're doing it. So yeah, they are in a data collection business, and they are mining that data. They have an army of people that are dictating your behavior, and they know what sells, what doesn't sell, why, and what they can try and push. And you know, I I mean, I think. Um, again, they, they put the Kevin, uh, um, mm-hmm. as the CEO who was from Microsoft, yeah. he's a full oh, blown yeah. tech guy. Um, so they replaced the coffee guy and the heart and, heart and soul with a, with a, a tech giant. Um, and you see that's where they're going. So, um, 
Yeah, I think it's it's certainly part of the future, and it, it's 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 crazy. You were this QAnon and whatnot, but I mean, this social experiment we're all going through, which is social media and all, all this time we're spending in front of our digital interfaces, is 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 can be jarring. How do you feel about times, it uh, um, when we think about connection and used to pick up the phone to call? I don't like it in some aspect. I think I mean I I, I accept it for what it is. Um, but I think when you think about uh, um, a telephone, I remember when people first started texting, it's like, you know, it was fun at the moment. But now it's like, when was, mm. the, was the last time I called my friend versus you, know, you only text uh, even crazier. Sometimes we, I find myself having really long, long conversations in Instagram. Just yeah, you to, could call them direct and message get it over with, and with somebody. 30 seconds. Oh, my best friend. There's no reason why. Right. So, but people just don't talk on the phone, talking on, getting a phone call from a friend right now is probably the equivalent of right. somebody popping up at your apartment Unexpected. or your house out unannounced like 20 years ago. You'd be like, why does this person How rude. in my house? It's like, <laughs> why is this person calling me? Why aren't they texting me? <laughs> but it's like, you lose this human connection. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it, it's, it's very strange what it does to people um, when you're just face even now, like you're on a Zoom call uh, and you lose elements of empathy or human connection or body language or kind of certain things are lost in translation. And it's like, you know, sometimes the way you orient your screen, I could be texting on my phone, but I'm holding it down here. You don't even have any idea because I'm still looking mm. at the camera, right? I haven't been doing that for, <laughs> for what it's worth, but um, there's all these ways of, 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 of saying there's ways of gaming the system. <laughs> yeah. um, and you, you, you can't do that in, in person, in, in person. So I'm, I'm very much a hands-on person. I, came into this business because I like being around people and having conversations, uh, creating things with my hands um, and interacting with people. So I do crave that. Um, and I think part of being a human is craving social activity. The media aspect of it is, it's always been strange how I wanted to navigate that personally. Obviously there's using it for business at this point, it's almost like you know non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing it, something's really oh, yeah. wrong. But as far as my personal life, um, you know, I, I, it, it's hard to toe the line as to how much you want to contribute and how much, you know, because you you see you can fall in a rabbit hole very quickly. Oh, yeah. you know, all of a sudden oh, yeah. you just logged on and the next night it's, it's been 30 minutes and why am I, you know, looking I've been down videos. on this timeline. I'm like, this is, <laughs> yeah, it makes it makes no sense at all. Will there be um, a Gregory's so app that, that follows uh, the same trajectory as I'm, what Starbucks is doing, do you think? Can you avoid it? Well, they, they I think we were, um, I think it's an interesting question because I think part of it is you can learn a lot about how to improve uh, and how to deliver a better mm -hmm. experience with intuition you gain from um, um, how people interact with the brand and whether it's on an app or not. It's, it's just really hard certain things in, in oh, person, yeah. right? So I, although you crave certain things in person, it's not trackable, right? So if somebody pays in cash uh, at my store that's great and i'm happy to have that happen but in, in the, what's happening with that customer over time i have no way of doing that if they're, that's like a one-time transaction but if somebody's on my app and I, ha I can actually understand how we're interacting with them what they like what they don't like what i can maybe push to them i could potentially give them a better experience by saying well, like what starbucks is doing like oh this person tried a vegan product at gregory's once uh, drinks my coffee, but then they haven't had a vegan product in a while. Launching something new, I should push them to that that person, that product to that person, and I think they'll enjoy it. And maybe maybe they wouldn't know it was there otherwise, and that maybe makes an impact on them. So, I think there's there's the good and the bad to it, right? Like it's 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 creepy to think you can do certain things, um, but then it's always like, well, what are you going to do with that power, right? Well, if you're, you're going to do it, get better for these people, uh, and and try and make their experience enhanced or give better or, um, better offerings or better better communication, cool. If it's just to kind of spy on them and do whatever weird things you want to do, then no. Um, but it, it's just like knowing what's out, these sorts of things. And, you know, um, I don't know what the back side of Starbucks looks like, but I just know that they're they're very smart um, oh, yeah. and in tune with all these sorts of tools. And, and um, progressive. They're going to make the best out of them and oh, Right. And I think they're, they're, they're rare in that they're in the pole position in our industry. And they're also moving at very 
quick speed for a company as big as they are um, in many different areas that, you know, um, it makes it hard for smaller companies to really um, k- keep up. Um, just like I said about their app. I mean, we're, we've had an app since 14. Um, we've had an order ahead for like the last three plus three to four years, I think. Um, and for that, we're pretty early, but we're still oh, yeah. behind them. They had it earlier than we did. And their stuff is probably not probably is definitely more more robust than than mine and i'm er, i'm ahead of most of my co my peers yeah. in the specialty coffee industry um as far as how long we've been doing it uh and the types of things that we've, we've been doing on our app um and obviously it's become more prevalent now during covid many that didn't have an app or you didn't do order ahead or just like well oh shoot i need this now um i've been doing it for a long time it's part of our dna um but certainly um starbucks is is no slouch when it comes that that's that's their bread and butter uh so i definitely admire them um and i think what they do on their app is is incredible uh and i'd love to do that more uh, under control and with the uh, with the yeah, right mindset behind be it for a big sure defining factor particularly with somebody like you who has kind of walked this line that's earned people's respect and trust and people value you. you're a true leader gregory you're you're somebody who people look at and you're the best kind of influencer because it's the kind of influencer oh, that you. isn't all about selfies you're the kind of influencer that isn't all about well hey look at how fucking fabulous i am your actions are why you're deemed an influencer and you know you're welcome thank you um and I look at what somebody like you would do with an app and I would tend to be like, I actually don't mind handing over my data to Gregory. I think he, he's not going to screw that. Well, you, you, should be, you should be careful with your data. Uh, you should definitely be I used to work for IBM. Data. I am very careful should. with my data. Uh, that being said, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That being said, I remember when we transitioned from a, a plastic loyalty card to an app, um, there was all yeah. this pushback from certain people that were like, well, I don't want to put my uh, credit card on this app and we, I don't trust it. And I'm like, I'm like, do you have an I- They have an iPhone. Yeah. I was like, do you have an iPhone? It's like, yeah. I'm like, do you have the app store? It's like, yeah. Do you have your, do you store your credit yeah. card, card on that? And he was like, yeah, doing this right tonight. Yeah. And he was like. Oh, they yeah. just unaware of it. How do I know you're going to do it right? And I'm like, I, I showed him. Well, yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize certain things. And I'm like, well, I showed him the company that we partner with on our app. And I'm like, here's all their security and all their backups and how they how they are protecting data and what, what their responsibilities are. And yeah, so I got many people to kind of get over that bridge. I mean, but again, six years ago, um, people were, weren't so right. comfortable, I don't think. But even now you think about... Uh, um, all the the hacking and, and like all this, like we're saying with with Starbucks and data and all this, all the stuff that you don't know, Google or whomever else is is analy- reading all your emails and sending you very custom mm-hmm. advertisements based on things that you type. Uh, Instagram listens to you, right? Oh, yeah. If you have your microphone on and you realize why you're talking about uh, your mattress, and then you all of a sudden you get an advertisement from Casper, and you're like, oh, yeah, that was weird. Uh, but yeah, all these things are, it's a, uh, it's a weird time and you know, it's how people are choosing to make money these days. It's really interesting. And sometimes you want to be a purist and other times want you want to say, well, how can I do this, do this <laughs> yes. in a way that's as ethical as humanly possible? Well, you got to be, there's an ethical, exactly. there's an ethical component to it. Right. I, 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 you know, I know there's some people that are, they're terrified of Facebook and Google and the data and, and what, what happens. And in their own business, they advertise on Instagram because they're like, well, it is the best way. So you have to sort of bite the bullet and do it. Uh, but you also, on the same token, understand that sometimes you're, you're a little wary as to how those companies are handling data and thinking about things. So it's this really strange paradox we're in right now in the in technology age and social media and data protection and privacy and whatnot. And um, I think making sure you're, you're, like you said, you're trusting the people you do do business on that kind of a very cursory level and making sure that, that yeah like you want to make sure the people you're you're spending your time with or you're you're giving business to are people that you 
hopefully you respect or respect what they stand for uh, and that kind of value system it should create a different level of trust between you and who you're giving your daily support i think to. this is going to be one of those times that helps push and influence all of that at the moment with who depending on who survives 2020 and 2021 and who doesn't i think that what's going to be left is going to set the stage for who's going to come in after that and help people understand like it's all free game now and how that's going to influence the the landscape in specialty coffee it'll be fascinating to watch all of it right it's certainly i mean it's it's been fascinating all along i think now than ever it's going to be really really interesting to see what happens over the next mm. year plus as you're saying just as people react to this hard time and what sort of pivots people make um not working um and yeah what the shake is going to be like the coffee uh community uh, the yeah. growth in specialty coffee uh, uh in the u.s has been absolutely explosive and in many places has been yeah. astronomical right there's there's a relatively low barrier to entry right you can take a very small space yep. get some metal tables get a used espresso machine and you and a friend can open Please a store don't. and it won't Please don't cost you that much money. And, you know, if you're hands on, you're not don't paying do so much it. labor. No, <laughs> you don't. But I, I don't think I don't know. I don't always think it's the smartest idea, but, but people do it. Mm -hmm. They do it time and time again. Um, and it's 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 what makes things challenging is it's such an easy thing that to get into. And people think it's very much easier mm -hmm. than I think it actually is. Um, and now what's happening is there's this crazy correction. And it's, it's to no fault of most. Most people, they may have been running a great business, uh, and depending on where their store was, what sort of their local government is put on them, maybe they can't even survive and it's not even a, any fault yeah. of their own. Or the people that are trying, um, but the way that their business is set up or where it is physically, it just it's going to be too much of a slog and they just don't have enough um, support to get through. So um, what happens to the competition? Uh, what happens to... Um, the pivots people make and the success or lack thereof with some decisions um, and just what happens in consumer preferences, right? I think, you know, sometimes you like to think coffee is bulletproof where it's not like Amazon can't get Amazon us. Amazon will right? find so a way to there's, get us. So uh, there's, you know, Best Buy is all these other companies. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, hey, you know, they're in Whole Foods listen now. To, I mean, they're, they're, listen to, they're, 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 you know, listen uh, to this, this podcast called um, Business Wars. And there's an Amazon versus mm. Walmart. And it's the evolution of how those two companies competed to become what they are. And when you hear how absolutely – like people like you and I couldn't be those people because we have in our DNA empathy. Yeah. These people, are uh, they don't have that. They, they're out there to just destroy whatever is in their way. We have too much integrity to do something like that and that would prevent us from being successful. But when you see the way that micro, that uh, Amazon set out to destroy Walmart and Walmart set out to destroy, they weren't about businesses that were necessarily trying to be proliferative. They were businesses that were out to destroy their, their enemy. I'm like, oh, wow, then coffee's not off the table when you look at the way that Jeff Bezos approached bookstores. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, you do feel for, I mean, it used to be Walmart putting all the mom and pop yeah. stores out and now it's Amazon saying like, we'll ship everything day free and at cheaper prices and we dare you to try and beat us because we'll, we'll take yeah. losses for the next three years yeah, yeah. to make sure you go out of business and then we'll be around at the end. So it's... Um, yeah, you, you hate to hear all those cutthroat stories and, and you know, uh, hearing some of that stuff. But, um, you know, um, especially coffee, I guess at the time, at the moment, it's not, you know, maybe they'll figure out a way to kind of come after us with some army of robots and drones and whatnot. But um, because there is always a human element and there's a there's a, a time sense of nature to drink many of our beverages, uh, it is hard and not impossible but uh in the near future i think we still have some real hope um to make some good things happen i think uh, so um based on how we have things now set up. before we wrap this up 
I wanted to ask you, what are you excited about with Gregory's in the future? Um, I mean, honestly, most of it is the future. Uh, and I think what we were just talking about, I think it's, it's a wild mm -hmm. time. It's scary. Um, it's challenging, but I keep telling my team, we're going to come out of this stronger than we were before. And we've sort of pushed a lot of chips and bets onto things that, um, I believe are going to yield a lot of fruit in the future for, for us. Um, and I think really trying to crystallize who we are, what we stand for and making sure everybody from myself down to the newest team member yeah. just gets it. Um, and, and emotes that and works and shows it in their, their output of the product of their work every day, I think um, will be very successful. And this is something that I want to move into new markets um, and we will be moving into new markets soon um, and updating technologies and, you know, companies like, like I said, Eversys and, and whatnot, oh, yeah. I think they're doing fantastic work. Um, and I'm really excited. I'm excited to start working with them and many others to push the boundaries of what we can do at a high level, at a consistently high level, um, and taking all of these things and seeing what the what the new yeah people are like well how many versions of Gregory's have there been I'm like well it, it's it's yeah. this like constant evolution right and I'm like we're not even if you think about the waves of coffee I'm like we're not even in wave three we're like in wave like three point five or three or four three whatever people say I'm like there's so many micro adjustments yep. that are happening constantly. Um, and we're making refinements in the things that we care about continually are, are adjusting to make just things overall better. And it's like, we're going to take what comes our way. We're going to look at this customer, what our customers are really craving and what they want out of their experience. Uh, and we're going to try and deliver it to the best of our abilities. And we're going to do it in a way that I think is going to be smart. It's going to be efficient. Um, and you know, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm really confident in our ability to do it at a really high level. Uh, and I'm just super psyched to, to get things going. Um, and God willing, get past this next you know few months of, of difficulty and whatever, whether vaccine comes or doesn't come and, you know, uh, obviously you gotta, <laughs> gotta mask up and do what you gotta do. Um, but, um, we're, uh, you know, just looking forward to getting so a little bit more. You, you, I think everybody will at a point where who knows when, but when we will be able to walk around and yeah. not have to be just scared or thinking about do I touch do I touch this thing? Do I not touch this thing? Do I wear a mask and not wear a mask? Well, I think people will be so happy to be able to be able to live life like that once again. That you know they'll really treasure it, uh, which we probably took all those things for do granted. You think many things for granted. Do you granted. think we will so, be able to get back um, to what we were before? I hope I have to believe so. I, I don't think it'll be the same. Um, I think people will always, I think this will shape because, because of how long it's going to last, it's going to yeah. affect so many things about how we, we think about the world. A lot of it will be, I mean, I think we're going to be much cleaner, <laughs> yes. much more hygienic, uh, conscious, much more, uh, focused. you know, you hear the, uh, yeah, conscious, you hear Anthony Fauci and he's like, you know, I'd be happy if nobody oh, ever yeah. shook hands again. Right. Like that's the number one way to yeah. transmit the flu. Right. So, you know, now we're, I used to be a big yeah. fist pump guy. Now I'm an elbow bump person. And it's, uh, you adapt, you know, you learn a lot about these things. You adapt, but just like the cleanliness, uh, goes along. Mm. It's going to go a long way. I think to not only have our, our spaces feel safer, but protect us from future things. Um, and just, I think it'll also help us cherish some of these human moments. Cause I think you, you saw a lot in the beginning, people like, Oh yeah, we love zoom and I can do everything remote forever. And then two months later, they're like, get me out of it. I can't be staring at the screen anymore. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I can't do this or talk about remote learning where they're like, like six months ago, they used to say, you know, a six year old, if they spent more than two hours behind a screen, that was horrible. Yeah. Now you want them to spend like eight hours in front of a screen for school. Become like how okay. did this all of a sudden become yeah, yeah. good? I don't know. Uh, yeah. So I think getting back to, um, Getting back to human connection uh, mm. is something I'm craving. I know a lot of other people are. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited and, and looking forward to many things like that. And I think um, it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out and when we can start. I hear about you. Like that. This conversation did not disappoint. So thank you. It 
I feel fed, oh. you know, yeah. like I feel like, uh, well, yeah, yeah. we, even, we were talking about MF doom. I think this is, <laughs> I didn't even realize how far we could go. So I'm, I'm psyched <laughs> to, uh, to follow up and go now get inspired to listen to some of my old, my old, uh, yeah. Nice. Again. Thanks for what you're doing for the example that you're setting, uh, in what people should be aspiring to in our industry. Um, you impress the shit out of me. So thanks for being somebody who does that. It's really lovely to be impressed by people. It's really lovely to be inspired by people. And uh, I hope we get, I I can't wait for us to talk again, but I hope we get the chance to just sit somewhere around the world sometime and have a coffee and have a conversation about MF Doom and Tribe Called Quest again. Yeah, (laughs) seriously. I mean, I'm a, you may you may have guessed I'm a coffee How, junkie. What do you I, drink? I, I will drink, you know, a dozen cups of coffee a day. Uh, I, I mean, I, I honestly do think I have about ten cups of coffee a day. I'm going to send you some so, elixir. Um, you haven't had it yet, have you? Okay. No. Okay. No, you got to send it my way. But yeah, that being said, I'll I'll, I'll have a, a coffee or three with you, and we could talk about music awesome. and podcasts, and uh, that'll be uh, that'll be amazing to be able to to do know, more right? of these things in person uh as much as i enjoy looking at you at the screen it's been fun uh but you know to do some of this stuff in person can't is wait. i can't uh i can't deny that i would prefer to be doing these things one-on-one the best of uh, luck to sure. you and to your team and your family and i hope that you guys get through covid and whatever 2021 is gonna because i'm not even jinxing anything by saying and whatever 2020 brings you away on to 2021 and i and i hope you guys get through it really really uh, safely yeah thank you so much and you as well i mean it's been an awesome awesome conversation thank you so much for having me uh and it's it's been a lot of fun and yeah great promise you'll come back excellent yes anytime peace of and peanut butter everyone thanks for tuning Mm. into the podcast and uh we'll speak to you soon Mm.